The production of metals causes about 8% of the total global energy consumption, and 30% of all industrial greenhouse gas emissions. This short trailer, teaches a few basics, about life cycle assessment of metallurgical products and processes. A full class about this topic will follow. Some definitions regarding life cycle assessment. The goal of life cycle assessment, is to compare the full range of environmental effects, assignable to products and services, by quantifying all inputs and outputs of material flows and energy consumption, and assessing, how these material flows affect the environment. This means, that life cycle assessment produces a model twin of the process, service, or product considered. The model must then take all input and output quantities into account, and subject them to operational functions that mimic the targeted processes. These operational functions can be regarded analogously as the mathematical model twin of the process's digestion system. This means, that life cycle assessment, is a quantification tool for the total environmental impact of products, processes and services. Particularly in the field of materials processes and metallurgical products, it evaluates the environmental burdens, and benefits, over the life cycle for a product, from cradle to grave, including material, and energy used during extraction and processing of raw materials, manufacturing, transportation, reuse, recycling, and end-of-life disposal. This requires a solid database to feed the model. This is coded in the form of a life cycle inventory. The life cycle inventory is a standardized method, to quantify emissions and consumed resources, and the related environmental and health impacts, as well as resource depletion issues associated with a product's life cycle. This schematic sketch shows a typical example of a product life cycle and the workflow for its assessment. At the beginning are the natural resources and the material production. This step must consider the required energy, the feedstock materials consumed, all transportation means required as well as all the emissions created during production. Next is a typical product manufacturing step where the same input and output quantities as well as the inbound and outbound transportation are taken into account. After that comes the use of a product, which can sometimes extend over only a few hours or days such as in the case of packaging, or over several decades such as in the case of larger infrastructures and buildings. This product lifetime and all the energy input required for its operation as well as all emissions created have to be built in. The product's lifetime is an important parameter for a total life cycle assessment. The same applies to the reliable modeling of scrap availability in future scrap markets. A simple example is that materials used in buildings enter the scrap market after many decades. In contrast, a drinking can is usually scraped soon after its use. After recycling and the production of a new can, it can be back in the supermarket shelf within a couple of weeks. After that comes the product disposal where similar balance considerations must be made. An important aspect of such life cycle assessment procedures is the question, where the gates and boundaries are placed between the individual manufacturing steps along the value chain. This also determines which costs must be covered by the manufacturer and which of these costs can be externalized to be covered by society. In other words where does a stepwise calculation start and where does it end when considering only a part of this total life cycle chain? This is important, because often these different steps along the life cycle are done by different companies. Therefore, stepwise life cycle assessments do not cover the complete through process life cycle, but only individual part of the entire chain. Such partial life cycle assessments can, therefore, provide an incorrect picture of the true environmental burden associated with a product or process. We look into this aspect in more detail on the next slide. This slide shows a schematic diagram with the different possible scales at which life cycle assessments can be conducted. On a macroscopic scale different external system boundaries for the entire product life cycle can be defined depending on whether factors such as mining equipment, chip construction, plant construction, 
the manufacturing of all the plant processing equipment, maintenance tools and infrastructures, fuel industries, landfill infrastructure or recycling infrastructures are included or not. In other words it must decide if these parameters and the associated emissions, resource and costs are internalized or externalized. All these external borders have to be properly defined to make the boundaries of the life cycle assessment transparent to the markets and legislative decision makers. Another question are the gates between the individual steps in the life cycle. As mentioned before it matters substantially to a life cycle assessment at which level of granulation it is conducted. For instance when considering steel as a typical product, its primary synthesis through the blast furnace and the steel plant route comes with huge CO2 emissions. In contrast, some parts of its downstream manufacturing chain are much more sustainable due to the often very long product use and the relatively high recycling rate, for instance in the case of expensive stainless steels. This means that certain steps of a value chain and life cycle can be or can appear rather sustainable, while others appear less sustainable and it is often an important task to make the connection among these steps transparent so that the entire life cycle is properly considered when estimating the sustainability of a certain product, process, or service. This is an example of a simple life cycle assessment of drinking cans made out of aluminium. Because secondary metallurgical production can be done over and over again, at very low environmental impact compared to the primary synthesis, thanks to the low melting point of only 660 degrees Celsius of aluminium, a used can is able to be recycled and ready for consumer use again in as little as a few weeks. Recycling aluminium cans saves up to 95% of the necessary energy consumption to create new cans through primary production. Aluminium recycling has generally a rather positive track record, more than 75% of aluminium ever produced is still in use. However counting the total recycled fraction integrated over a larger alloy family can be sometimes misleading, also in terms of the very different time scales that different types of products are in use. It is often more adequate to measure progress in recycling in terms of the fraction of recycling that happens at the end of a product's life. In that context the aluminium can is a nice example for a life cycle assessment. 200 billion aluminium cans are produced globally every year, which translates to 6,700 cans produced every second. For 1,000 cans the life cycle assessment shows all the resources that have been consumed. It becomes apparent that particularly the huge consumption in electricity is a high burden. Actually, Currently 2% of the world's energy use is spent on producing aluminium. This is due to the high enthalpy of formation of the aluminium oxide. Also the consumption of water is rather high. This translates on the emissions side particularly to a very high output of CO2. This fraction can of course be substantially influenced, depending on the electricity source, that is being used for electrolysis during primary synthesis. The third category lists the impact assessment, which shows, how these different emissions and consumption items act on aspects, such as ozone depletion, and global warming, but also on soil acidity. Here is another example of life cycle assessment for the case of iron and steel making. With about 1.8 billion tons of iron production per year, the environmental burden associated with this material is extremely high globally standing for about 30% of all industrial CO2 emissions. These data are taken from a publication about the life cycle assessment of steel produced in an integrated steel factory. There will be a full lecture on this topic. This slide only serves as a very concise first introduction into this complex topic. This flow diagram shows the input of coal, vapor, and electricity that is used for operating the coke oven plant, which then feeds the sintering plant, which in turn is the basis to operate blast furnaces, where the actual reduction of the iron ore takes place. This is also the production step where most of the CO2 is produced. The so produced iron, which is also referred to as pig iron, is next transported to the steel plant, 
In the steel converter the carbon is further reduced by blowing oxygen into the liquid iron carbon melt. The liquid steel, after having adjusted its desired target composition in the secondary ladle metallurgical treatment, is then cast into slabs, that are further subjected to warm rolling. Casting is in integrated steel plants mostly done by using continuous casting machines, often in several parallel strands. Here we zoom in a bit, to reveal some of the details and exact numbers for the example of the converter plant. Besides the well-known input and output quantities, it is interesting to realize that also in the steel converter, substantial amounts of scrap iron are used. This scrap is required for cooling the liquid material in the converter vessel down, as the oxidation of carbon produces substantial amounts of heat. In some of the current sustainability scenarios it is considered to enhance the cooling scrap at least by a few percent, thereby reducing the amount of primary material required from the blast furnace. On the emission side it is apparent, that particularly the CO2 production in the steel plant is very high. The reason for that is, that the pig iron is essentially in the eutectic point of the iron carbon phase diagram. This means that the pig iron, coming from the blast furnace, contains still substantial amounts of carbon. This high carbon content, which is about 4.3 weight percent in the eutectic point, must be reduced prior to casting the material into slabs. This was only a very concise appetizer, for the full class about life cycle assessment, in the context of materials science and engineering, and the associated downstream products. I hope that you enjoyed it.